Well, welcome back. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, if you weren't with us last time, I come from a clinical social work background and I've become a researcher. I'm really interested in at-risk youth specifically and peer support being a really hot thing right now. And there's a lot of folks out there who really like the idea of doing it and there's not a lot of folks who are, are doing what y'all are doing and, and working with me and working with others to really figure out how can we do this to really make an impact on young adult clients, young adults with serious mental health challenges. A lot of my work is, is really translating research into practice and then practice back in research. I love having my, my feet in, in both of those very siloed areas. I have this really cool job at Thresholds where I get the opportunity to partner with service providers to really understand how and why services are working and figure out how to capture outcomes of our young adults who engage in our service models. And I have a really awesome job with UMass RTC where I get to think about peer support and its role. And I've been involved, oh, I'm getting some feedback. Okay, um, and I've been involved in a, in a three-year project that was at Thresholds that uh, integrated young adult vocational peer mentors as an add-on to uh, the individual su uh, support, supported employment model. And the reason why we did that was we recognized that our young adults didn't necessarily have role models in their lives, and specifically Thresholds works with a population, population of very at-risk youth who not only have serious mental health conditions, but have lengthy histories of being involved in the child welfare system and have been in residential care for a long time. And so really integrating young adults who can share their recovery stories, share how they've been successful with work and school we thought would be really powerful. And I had the opportunity to serve as the developer of the peer support element and then the supervisor for the peer mentor. So it was really cool. I'm hoping to, to bring my knowledge of the field and the research and then pair it with some of my lived experience as a supervisor. Also, if you notice on the left, I have a picture that's me in the middle. Um, I always like to share a little tidbit about myself when I'm doing a talk. And this is when I was a young adult. I just up and moved across the country. I don't know. Any of you out there just, you know, did things like that when you were young adults and just really, you know, didn't really plan ahead at all. And I ended up working in retail management for a long time. And I discovered um, social work in the child welfare field really through two of my friends whose moms were social workers. And I think we need to really draw from our own stories and our own development and figuring out who we were in our 20s because that's where we really were figuring it out as to what career and, and, and what we were going to be and who we were going to be. And so that's my, my little tidbit story. It's a really old photo. I have bangs now. Okay, so moving on. This is um, repetitive from, from the last webinar, but really this, this webinar is uh, aimed at a very specific population for supervisors who are working with young adult therapeutic peer mentors in Massachusetts. I really want you guys to feel like you get um, exactly or have some really strong understanding of what are the types of things that young adult therapeutic peer mentors are going to experience on the job and how you can support that. Um, today, we're really going to focus on self-care and resiliency on the job. You guys have this awesome role, family partners in Massachusetts. Use their uh, expertise. Partner with your family partners to really support your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. And just to quickly say that, you know, this training series was based on a number of conversations. In today's talk, I talked to a lot of, but we have a really strong peer support program in our adult community mental health system um, at Threshold specifically, which is the agency that I work with. And I have talked with a number of 20-somethings who are in the peer support worker role and about their experience with sharing their stories. Because I had worked specifically with young adults, working with young adults, and I thought it would be interesting to really understand, like, do they, do they struggle with the same things I struggled with? And so I'm really hopeful I'll be able to integrate some of what I've learned from them as well. Okay, and Dee has already introduced this. Basically, I hope to talk for about 60 minutes, and then I really want you guys to ask questions. Please, 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 as your questions bubble up, please write them in so that we can keep um, track of them and make sure I get to them. The topics today, and we are going to really try to cover a lot, um, relational boundaries I want to start out with. Then I'm going to talk about this concept of psychological capital and why that matters for young adult therapeutic peer mentors. 
then I want to think about how empathy is really important and there's ways to help to make sure empathy exists in therapeutic peer mentor and their young adult client experiences, but that it's really more than empathy. Accommodations, I'm going to touch on and some of the accommodations that were co very common in my practice as a supervisor. And I also want to talk about strategic storytelling and some of there's a literature out there that could be really helpful in helping you to support your young adult therapeutic peer mentors and using their stories with their young adult clients in very helpful and supportive ways. And then very, very briefly, I'm going to mention some ideas that I have and things I've done around demonstrating. Um, and being able to capture outcomes of your um, peer mentoring process, and then also the benefits of being a clinical supervisor of peer mentors. Because let me tell you, I don't know a person who has not thrived and really enjoyed working with young adult therapeutic peer mentors, or in my setting, uh, peer mentors or peer support workers. It's very rewarding. So I want to end with that on a good note. But at the end of our webinar last time, there was some questions about stigma and the types of stigma that uh, face young adult peer support workers in their, in their integration in the agency. And so I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about some of the key things you can do to facilitate the integration of young adult therapeutic peer mentors at your agency. One thing is to really clarify that role. What is it that the young adult therapeutic peer mentor is doing? What, where are they housed? Where's their space? Who's their supervisor? What teams do they work with? What's their day structured like? And again, that's a process to figure those things out. As we were developing our program, that actually all changed over time as well. So just to recognize, you have to be thoughtful that the role will evolve, but you need to document what that role is and share it widely. Everyone at the agency should know what the young adult peer um, support worker, or therapeutic peer mentor's role is. Also, this is really, really key. Do not expect your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to be the ones who have to educate their, their new colleagues about their role. Imagine if you had to, as a supervisor, a therapist, or family partner, explain your role to everyone over and over and how frustrating that would be. And so you really have to be helpful and a facilitator in making sure that everyone's on the same page about the role, the nature of the role, what the expectations are, and what the impact is going to be. One way you can do this is you can integrate into your training for, and I'm talking about all staff training and orientation at your agency. And this is something I'm advocating right now that happened at Thresholds, um, is that we really have a focus on peer support because we have peer support workers um, that are part of, we have, um, we've adapted a sort of community treatment and we call it community support. And we have on each of these teams, a peer support worker, someone with lived experience who's part of the team, but we don't necessarily have um, an understanding of what exactly, how that work looks any different from someone else on the team. And so really getting everyone on the same page is important. So training that's part of all staff orientation, that an element of it be focused on your peer mentor positions, what that is. And also I would agree with the family partner, making sure everyone knows the value and, and what that role looks like and why it matters. Also, that you have to make sure that you're always having a dialogue. And you're going to hear me say the terms reflective and the term dialogue a lot today because it's really making sure you're talking about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room being, wow, it doesn't seem like the young people are being integrated well, the young people who are in these therapeutic peer mentor positions. And we want to just make sure we recognize that it might be challenging and for various reasons at various agencies, depending on the culture. And so you just need to make sure you're having a discussion about it. And I would suggest having a steering committee that's meeting regularly at least a month or at least every month to discuss the integration of this new role and all the barriers that come with it. Also, something that I mentioned this at the end of the webinar, but this was a learning process for me, was just really, really ensuring that the young adult therapeutic parents are recognized as staff, that they have access to all the benefits, to all the meetings, to all the things that their colleagues would have access to, that they are involved in the, the um, team meetings regularly, that time during the team meeting is dedicated towards their involvement and their report of their experience. 
and also that they're on the listservs. And so if there's, you know, a listserv for your agency or the building or the team, that they're on that. And there's, you know, it seems so concrete and so simple, but just making sure that they're involved will do a lot to making sure that they are truly involved and integrated in your agency. One thing that I really emphasize, and this also was a learning curve for me, was that I wanted to make sure that I assessed, I was always kind of doing an assessment to figure out like what staff were on board with peer mentors and what and which staff weren't. Um, and then I would really focus on partnering the staff who might not be totally on board on making sure they got to know the peer mentors, um, that they would go out in the community to Together and maybe visit a client um, that I would I would go to my colleagues who might not be on board about the idea of a young person with lived experience sitting in on their group and providing extra support. I would talk to those colleagues about, hey, why don't you have lunch with this person? Why don't you take them with you? Like, why don't you mentor them? You take the opportunity to teach them. Think about it as a resume builder for yourself. Like you are mentoring a young person, and usually staff would bite at that. The one thing you don't want staff to feel like is that they have to manage this extra person. You want to emphasize the added value, the opportunity to really learn from young adult peer mentors because you will, right? You're, you need to recognize they're going to teach you as much as you're going to teach them. Also, creating open lines for communication. This is really, really important and will look different, I think, from agency to agency. But this was me being very much a people person and consistently reaching out to the staff that I knew, so the non-professional, or sorry, the non-peer staff, so non-peer staff who were perhaps running groups or working with clients or on teams that also that my peer mentors were on, that I would make sure that I was having a dialogue with them about the peer mentor's performance, how it was going, the relationship that this staff person has with the young adult peer mentor, that I was just always making sure we were talking about that so that we could recognize when maybe something wasn't going well and have a conversation about it in real time. One thing you want to avoid, and I think this is just good practice in general uh, in a clinical setting, is you, you don't want your staff who are frustrated with the addition of a, of a young adult peer mentor to be talking to each other and that fostering more problems and more ideas that perhaps this role is just added challenge to our daily working and that's not really doing anything. And so you want to really nip that kind of group think in the bud and you want to make sure that your young adult peer mentors and your young and that non peer staff are coming to you with any concerns that they have. Also, really language matters. With my young adult peer mentors that I supervised, I consistently would use the word colleagues. I would always refer to the other staff, not just as other staff, like, oh, your colleague on your team or your teammate or, your, you know, that it was always about this. We're all on the same page. We're all partnering together and focusing on young adult outcomes. And I think that by doing that, ling linguistic shift can be helpful, especially for the young adults in the peer mentor role to recognize, oh, hey, I do have a lot to offer. I do have things to, to teach. Um, and I, I can be very beneficial at the agency. You wanna make sure your young people feel empowered because sometimes it can feel very disempowering to be around staff who just don't quite understand why you're there and feel like you're an extra thing to manage, which I know this was something at the end of the webinar I think people were alluding to, like how do I really help staff embrace this? Um, this kind of uh, is a little bit, this bullet is like what I mentioned a little bit earlier, but you really, really have to explore the problem. You don't wanna simply say, oh, this peer mentor doesn't seem to be working out. Really thinking through, okay, so what is it that's happening here, that that, see, that it appears that the peer mentor is not integrating in? Is it the, the staff person believes? Is it our agency's practices? Is it the young adult's way of thinking doesn't seem to align with the staff person's? What is happening? And it, it's not something that you can wait a week or wait two weeks. You really wanna address this as soon as possible, so be very timely. Um, another thing that I ended up doing a lot was inviting staff to our clinical supervision group. And we, we had a group once a week, and I would I ended up, some of the staff that were a little confused about 
why peer mentors, what, what's the deal with them, I would invite and, and just have like a sharing session, like, oh, tell us about your role. And depending on who that person was, if they were a therapist, like, tell us what you do. And then have the peer mentor share a little bit like what they do and how they think and how they share their story. And it was always very enlightening for people to learn, like, oh, like this is your training and this is why you do this. And this is what um, motivated you to, to choose this role. Also, um, and this is, again, I think reiterating the point that it's, it's really not about individuals. And early on, we struggled with keeping peer mentors in the role. And we really had to examine our agency culture and practices and be like, what is going on? And at first, and I may have mentioned this in the last webinar, we focused on hiring program graduates because we really believed that that was the, the key thing. And I, we know our, our clients actually really valued working with graduates as well. However, that being, said, it, that being said is there's a lot of work that needs to go into making sure that a program graduate can be successful working in that environment where they were the client. Um, and that you have to be doing a lot of support around that and a lot of education. And finally, supervisors out there, you need to get supervision around this. Every time that something comes up where you're like, man, I don't really know what to do with this, you need to talk through it. Any situation that you feel very, very uncomfortable with that your young adult therapeutic peer mentor brings to you, bring it to your supervisor. And if you don't have a supervisor that's doing that kind of you know, examination of practice with you, then find someone at your agency or go to your therapist and talk through this and think through how you can really be supportive of the situation that seems to be um, an agency issue where staff aren't necessarily accepting a certain person's views. No, there's also no best practices of, of how to do this and how to best support young adult therapeutic peer mentors, and then we're all trying to figure it out, um, but that you should really think of yourself as an advocate and coach um, for young adults, but you might have to engage in some education around conflict resolution with your colleagues. Um, you might have to help them sort through some things, and this is really important for relational boundaries. I think we all think red flags when we think young adults working with other young adults um, who have mental health challenges and that really we need to be rethinking uh, relationships and how relationships are these incredibly powerful things and that relationships really are what practice is. And I know I talked a lot about the Working Alliance in the last webinar. This is an extension of that that I hope is helpful. I mean, basically, it's really, really important to recognize when you're doing good, supportive supervision of your young adult therapeutic peer mentors is you have to recognize that there's a relationship occurring between you and your young adult therapeutic peer mentor, and there's also a relationship occurring between the young adult therapeutic peer mentors and their clients, and that your relationship needs to be a healthy one with your young adult therapeutic mentors has to be a supportive one and needs to be one that emphasizes mutuality. I'll get into this in a minute. So there are all these pieces that are part of peer support. This is building on Spencer's research at Boston University as to what's important as um, key elements to make sure that peer support works. And they have to do with all of these different really um, hefty constructs, right? Like trust and authenticity and companionship and collaboration. But these inherently should be what defines your relationship with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. And I know you might think, mm, companionship, mm, but think about your relationship with your supervisors over the years and who was your best supervisor? Was it someone who um, was you were able to relate to and that you felt collegial with and that you felt a companionship with think about those colleagues you go to to process your stressful days your stressful situations with clients right like think about that and like how empathy plays out in those relationships and authenticity and how that matters and so what you want to be doing is making sure that these things exist in your relationship with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors. You're not just collaborating with them, right? Or partnering with them and making sure that they are and supporting them in their work with their clients. But you're also thinking about achieving these other things that then they can work to achieve with their clients. So it's a parallel process. And so mutuality is where it's at. And don't worry, I will get into the boundaries on mutuality. But I mentioned this in the last webinar, and I think it's worth mentioning again, that peer support 
is essentially founded on this concept that mutuality is healing and empowering, right? And it's what makes peer support special. And here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post a mega quote. I'm going to read it. But why I like this quote is that it really, to me, gets at why mutuality matters in delivering peer support. So here I go. With intentional peer support, we share our stories in ways that help others consider how their beliefs and assumptions have created their reality, understanding choices, and even their relationships. Although we may have had similar experiences, we listen for how people have learned to tell that particular story, and we ask questions that create space for reflection and awareness. We explain that we're not just there to provide help, but rather we're there to contribute to a conversation, and I'll argue a dialogue, or a process where we actively challenge each other and where recovery becomes a mutual dynamic relational process as well as an outcome, right? So the healing part is that the peer support person, your therapeutic peer mentors are engaging in this relationship that allows this young adult client to support a little bit, right? that they are going to build a bond where they're going to help each other. And we need to embrace that, that that's a healthy thing. It might seem scary because we are going to define our therapeutic peer mentors as staff, right? And there, there's this definition between who is the helper and who is the person being helped. And I think we need to step back from that and recognize we want these relationships to, to look more mutual, to feel more mutual, because that's where the healing happens. That's where the recovery happens. Okay, before I get into putting boundaries on, on mutuality, I want to talk a little bit about reflective supervision. This comes out of um, early childhood field, and if folks on, are on the webinar who have been trained in early childhood intervention and working with families, this is often how supervision is structured, um, that it's based in collaboration, and so early on in the relationship that you as a supervisor have with your young adult therapeutic peer mentor, that you sit down and you talk about, our relationship is going to look like this. It's going to be a mutual relationship that we both are going to learn and grow from, and you're explicit about this from the beginning. Right? It's not supposed to be hierarchical. The power in the relationship is supposed to be the same. And I'm a social worker by training and very aware of how power plays out in relationships in all sorts of ways. And so this may be hard to sit with. It's not always easy for me to sit with. But it's worth taking a step back as a supervisor and getting in that space where you're like, ah, oh, I'm going to learn from this person. This person might provide me with support and being okay with that. Okay. Also, Reflective supervision demands that it has to be regular. This might seem very concrete and ridiculous to mention, but having regularly scheduled time with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors, if it be individual, and I highly suggest if it can be group um, supervision at least twice a month, that, it, that you have it scheduled, you hold that time sacred. It has to be protected because this is a time to reflect on your practice and examine what you're doing to learn about yourself as a therapeutic peer mentor, to learn about yourself as a supervisor. It's all about reflection. And this is where you focus on relationships. And you think, okay, what are the relationships here? How are they playing out? Why do I have bonds that are stronger with some clients and less so with others, right? You really wanna help your therapeutic peer mentors think through that. You want to think about gaining self-awareness. And we're gonna talk a lot about self-awareness and self-care and how that is really, really important. But you want to also focus on emotions. And now you're probably thinking, oh, my God, she's talking about therapy. I don't want to be a supervisor who provides therapy to my staff. But what I want you to take a step back is to think about if we are saying that we want these therapeutic peer mentors to be doing good peer support with their clients, they have to be building relationships. And in doing so, they're going to experience emotions because relationships make us feel things. And so the way to talk about this is you have to have an open dialogue about relationships and about how they're making me feel. And if you feel uncomfortable with the word relationship, you can use the word interactions um, if you, that feels a little safer for you. And you can say, what were those interactions like? What are you doing? But saying about the thing about relationship, I think, is powerful. And you can tell that this comes out of early intervention with children because it's really about building relationships with the families too, right? Because you're really working with mom and dad and caregiver as well as with kiddo. And so there's a lot of relationships happening. Um, and that's the, the, the reality of working with young adults too. And they're going through a shift in their development where they're, they're reestablishing and reconfiguring their relationships. And so it's key to just have relationships 
on the table as up for discussion in all of your supervision. Okay, but here's where we put some boundaries on mutuality. Um, the clarity between who's the helper and who is the receiver of help is going to vary from therapeutic preventor to their clients and then to each client between them. It's just always going to vary and it's going to change over time where when we hope that this happens, we hope that the young adult clients will sometimes be able to provide support. That's a very important experience to have. It's very healing, but you need to have limits on these. For instance, and I mentioned some of these in my last webinar, only I'm reiterating them because I think it's important, you know, key, key yeses and no's. So no um, sexual relationships, no using substances with uh, your clients, no uh, physical fighting and having very clear, those are not relational dynamics that we allow as part of this peer mentoring relationship. That being said, if you start to feel attracted to one of your clients, let's talk about it. But that's not uncommon, right? But that it just can't go into the realm of where it's an, an actual relationship that happened or there actually is a punch thrown where you became so irritated that that's how you reacted. Um, at times, you might have to intervene and help to manage relationships. So let me give you an example of this that I had done a number of times where and you want you don't want to you don't want to cut a relationship off necessarily and just say and, and you might have to for safety reasons let me just give this example of when a young adult uh client is um <laughs> triggering for whatever reason your uh therapeutic peer mentor and your therapeutic peer mentor has talked about it with you they've talked about how particularly like you're you're ir they're irritated they don't know why this person says these things they really bother them that your therapeutic peer mentor has been able to use their voice and say wow when you say that that really bothers me and to you know generate a dialogue or a discourse about that feeling in that relationship um, but that it fails and the young adult client um, for some reason um, does something or the therapeutic peer mentor does something that's inappropriate in the relationship um, theft happened, um, punching happened, sexual relationship happened, there's things that happen. And the key is you want to talk about these things. You want to have your young adult therapeutic peer mentors and your young adult clients to have a dialogue when their relationship starts to get rocky for whatever reason. You want them to work through it. It is an incredibly powerful experience to talk about the quality of a relationship and identify what perhaps needs to change and then what you're going to move forward to make those changes and to then continue the relationship and recognize it instead of cutting it off. Our youth who are involved in systems have had too many relationships that have been cut off. And so we need to be more thoughtful about how we can help people continue on a relationship when maybe that there's some dynamics that are upsetting. Now, mind you, if safety becomes an issue, you, you can, of course, of course, use your best judgment as a clinician and go to your supervisor and talk it through with your supervisor. Also, something that's really important just to mention is fairness. This came up a lot in supervision um, with the peer mentors I worked with and how clients would perceive that their relationship with another client um, was better for some reason or closer and that they were jealous. And so really having a dialogue about that and how you can help therapeutic peer mentors go to those clients that are concerned or jealous or, or just angry about the, the, the fairness that they're perceiving that something is unfair and have a conversation about like, well, what's unfair about it and how could I achieve that type of relationship that you're desiring with you? Or if I can't, let me explain why right and have a real really a discussion about it really really helpful and i've said in on many um i've sat in with young adult clients and the therapeutic preventer and worked through those things and that's really really key also very 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 important is establishing communication best uh, practices at your agency this is for in-person interactions between your therapeutic preventers and your young adult clients where are they meeting is it in the community? Is it at the agency? Safety issues, you really want to think about what does that look like? Also texting, email, social media, your agencies are going to have different policies on this. Make sure that your therapeutic peer mentors know those policies and are practicing those policies. Um, we definitely were developing policies as we were working on this stuff, but we, def we decided on a, a no Facebook friending rule and our agency holds that if you are a client staff cannot befriend you, but after folks leave in discharge, then it's up to the um, staff to make that decision. 
But however, like thinking through those dynamics and those are relational dynamics, technically, you want to be supportive of those social media is very, very important in facilitating relationships. But you want to recognize that if texting, if a young person is texting, uh, a young adult client is texting a therapeutic peer mentor constantly, help your therapeutic peer mentor teach that client about how that behavior is not helping their relationship. Okay, so here's where we get, here's an excellent activity, and I have, here's the PDF on it. If you'd like to look at it, there's quite a few of these online, very, very helpful tools in exploring those sticky situations of when mutuality, there needs to be some boundaries put on it, um, and having discussions about these different behaviors. Um, hugging is one that always comes up with the students they supervise and the peer mentors are touching, like, should I do that? When is it okay? When is it not? And having a real conversation about this, these types of sticky situations, especially I would argue this is where group supervision is so key because you are gonna have disagreements about these. And as young adult therapeutic peer mentors are working with you over time, working with clients, they will have different reactions to these things. Early on, it might be very black and white, like, no, I would never do that. And then in reality, it's like, well, maybe in this condition, or maybe if like this was the case. And so having conversations about these types of sticky situations, so incredibly important. Okay. Also, very quickly, I want to mention how complex confidentiality is for young adult therapeutic peer mentors. Of course, we want to comply with HIPAA, of course, right? We want this to be um, part of training early on with our peer mentors. We also want to follow up with confidentiality standards at least once a quarter, just reminding folks about not sharing information, uh, health information specifically. Also, we want to talk about secrets. And so this happens a lot where our young adult clients like to say things like, oh, don't tell anyone else this. And we want to establish that our relationship as a young adult therapeutic peer mentor with my client is one where we just don't keep secrets, that we work as part of a team. And, and the way you can coach your young adult therapeutic mentor is just to explain this to their clients is just to simply say, in order for me to be effective at my job, I'm, I need the support of my supervisor. So everything that we talk about, I'm gonna usually process it with my supervisor. It's called reflective supervision. I'm always reflecting on what I'm doing. And so we can't have secrets. Just being really clear about that, no secrets allowed. But here's something that's really interesting that I don't think we talk about enough, and it, it happened a few times with different peer mentors that I worked with, was that our clients are not held to the same HIPAA standards as our staff. And so, um, for example, when you share a very traumatic story with a client and it, you know, you're doing it with the best intentions, the client seems to really get it, but then that client decides to share that story with their peers who happen to live in the same residence, that, that you need to know that's a possibility. And so that's when you have to make decisions about what you share and what you don't share and who you share certain stories with and who you don't. And that's what supervision's about, is having discussions about that, right? And then as a therapeutic mentor, if that happens to you, that you need to work with your supervisor to help um, be able to find the language to, to talk to that young adult client about how that made that person feel. Like, wow, when you shared my story with everyone, it impacted me in this way. And it helps put boundaries for the young adult clients on what they're sharing, right? But just recognize that that's really important in strategic storytelling is knowing who your audience is and when you tell a client they're not held to HIPAA regulations. And so please, please emphasize that, mention it and, and bring it up, I think every time, every at least once a quarter, that this is a reality. Okay, outreach is really important and this might seem kind of silly to think about, but I need to mention it is this happened that with a number of our peer mentors who just stopped showing up to work. They were embarrassed about not doing well. They felt like they weren't doing well. They felt like they weren't making progress. They were experiencing some symptoms. Maybe they had a bad interaction with a staff person that made them feel like they weren't effective. And you need to do outreach. You need to, if a, if a therapeutic peer mentor's behavior changes very, very significantly, reach out to them. Don't wait till your supervision time. Give them a call and say, hey, I just want to check in. I noticed that, you know, things seemed a little different. Tell me what's going on because you want to make sure you're intervening. And I know this might seem like you're treating your staff like a client, but you would do this if, if a friend or family member changed their behavior drastically. You check in. So you want to check in, all right? Another thing is the outreach, and this is done in the process two part, that happens between therapeutic peer mentors and their clients. 
that you really want to support your peer mentors in doing outreach with their clients, but just recognize that that outreach plays a part in their relationship and that the outreach might be beneficial or it might be hurtful and that young adult might need to disappear for a while for their own recovery for whatever reason they're experiencing that they need to disengage from services or disengage from the relationship with the peer mentor you need to respect that and have dialogues about that and again that's what supervision is about is talking about when young people disengage from treatment how we don't take that personally how we do some outreach and if it doesn't seem to be working maybe we back up because we want to respect that person's choice right that recovery is about choice okay so psychological capital such an interesting concept i think it's so so key for young adult peer support worker success specifically psychological capital is a positive state is a positive psychological state of being that's characterized by these things self-efficacy optimism perseverance hopefulness and resilience and that these things can be fostered right so your job as a supervisor is to foster these types of things on the job resiliency in your therapeutic peer mentors what's interesting and i mentioned this in my last webinar is that supervision needs to be multi-dimensional it needs to touch on a lot of different things um, it just shouldn't be about performance and skill development or, or talking about challenging cases it needs to be about self-care and wellness it has to be talking about career development relationships that i talked about very very important um and just really really key and, and i do think about supervision as ways you can integrate new ways of thinking so as many trainings as you're going and really working with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to bring in what they learn at trainings or what they're learning from clients or learning from a family partner that you let um, the young adult therapeutic peer mentors take the lead again this works really well when you're doing group supervision because you can let um, you don't have have to be in charge as much you can let that mutual relationship take place by stepping back a little bit and letting the young adult therapeutic peer mentors step up and share some of what they're learning i wanted to just quickly discuss what resiliency is i don't want to get too academic and heady here but i think when we think about resiliency on the job and we think about self-care we think about it really simply like oh yeah do you have like a coping skill you can use and what we need to avoid thinking about resiliency is just like a go-to coping skill, like, oh, you're gonna go take a bath or you're gonna take a walk around the block. And those things can be really helpful, but it really is about a pattern of um, your experience or pattern of how you react at work, right? How you handle stress and distress while you're in at work, working with clients that are challenging, working in an environment where people might not get why you're there, right? And self-care also is a pattern, right? That you practice self-care, that it's something that isn't a quick go-to coping mechanism. It's something that you're thinking about as a process. And on the lower right of the screen, you'll notice this is my own model, is thinking through self-care as things. And as a supervisor, rather than thinking you're helping, you know, your young adult therapeutic preventers process their mental health experiences, help them explore how they can take care of themselves and how they can role model self-care for their clients right they can explore different ways to take care of themselves they can try out activating new ways and know that we all will, will engage with self-care practices for a while and then we fall off the boat and we get back on and it's a process right and it's really connecting with others about self-care that allows us to keep with those processes sharing self-care tips and experiences that are really really important one thing that's really important is addressing things that get in the way of taking care of yourself you can have the best self-care plan in the world it can be amazingly concrete that you're gonna drink water five times a day you're gonna exercise you're gonna eat well you're going to go to yoga you're going to attend church you're gonna do all these things but if there's a whole bunch of crap getting in the way of you doing any of that you really aren't going to make much progress and so you have to address some of those things Self-care also isn't unidimensional, it is multidimensional. I have a slide on that in just a moment. And also we cannot recognize, although we call it self-care and it really needs a new word, um, it really is about taking care of yourself within, it, within the agency context. And so the agency should be supportive. Supervisors, y'all have to take care of yourselves to do good work and role model. But you have to be working with an agency that gets it. Okay, so why do we care about psychological capital? Um, and why I care about self-care for, for young adult therapeutic peer mentors? And my argument is it's a very, very tall order 
to expect young adult therapeutic peer mentors to maintain balance in their work and personal life 100% of the time to be role models for their clients. That's a lot. We don't expect us, like as a, as a practitioner, um, we tend to be like, oh, I'm not going to share my stuff. I'm not going to share what's going on with me. But we expect our therapeutic peer mentors to do that. And that can be challenging. They might feel a lot of pressure to always be on and always be making good decisions in their work life and personal life. And that can be stressful. And so what you've got to do is make sure in supervision that you have a principle in your practice as a supervisor that we recognize we all have off days and that we all need to really know where, what are our signs of feeling distressed and feeling stressful at work, right? How do we recognize those? What are the early signs, right? And that we have to develop an individualized self-care plan. And you can do this with each of your young adult therapeutic care mentors early on to help them recognize like self-care matters. In order for you to be successful, self-care matters. And I've got some resources for that as well because it can be very detailed. And there's a lot of... Um, <laughs> There's a lot of importance in having it be detailed in order for it to actually take place. Also, as I just mentioned before, supervisors, you've got to be taking care of yourselves on the job, right? So you've got to start practicing this as well. I know that can be stressful. And one super key, super basic thing is you have to encourage for yourself and for your therapeutic peer mentors that they take their breaks during the day, they take lunch and that they also use their personal time and vacation time. You need to make sure this is happening. We don't do a great job of this at thresholds. Like we're, I'm working on it. Like with the staff I work with, we really need to make sure that folks are taking the time to do the things that you know makes them happy whole beings. And also on the right, you'll see my little tip. And this comes from my background of being a DBT therapist is when you're working and when you're supervising young adult therapeutic peer mentors, when they're having a really stressful day, instead of focusing on, tell me what's so stressful, give me the details, forget all that. Focus on what self-care practice are you going to utilize right now? Ask that. How are you going to use your self-care plan? Let's pull your self-care plan out and let's talk through what you're going to do to fix this or to feel better or to feel more stable right now. And that's how you get away from it being therapy. All right. The refrigerator list. This is a great start. So these are um, very, very popular in social work. Many of you on this webinar may have seen these early on in your career, um, where you just have these lists, you either uh, develop them with your clients or you hand them out to your clients as ways to like remember how they could take care of themselves. This is a great start. But what you want is to be thinking more broadly. And as you know, you're developing your relationship with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors, you're thinking about self-care across all of these different dimensions. And when I do workshops on this with practitioners, we always jump to uh, nutrition and exercise. People feel very, very comfortable with those two. And that's great to start there. But maybe you also start to think about smell and context and space and all the different things that matter in, in facilitating our well-being on the job and our resiliency on the job. And so touching on all these when you're creating self-care plans, really important. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're going to see a number of different resources that I think are super helpful for self-care. Um, all of these have worksheets and different exercises you can do to engage uh, folks around self-care. Some are um, developed for practitioners, some are developed for clients, but I think all of them are really helpful. Um, basically, these are just some quick tips. Emotions can be a beautiful thing. You Everyone's going to experience emotions and relationships. You need to be talking about them. And guess what? Some days you're going to feel bad. Someone's going to tell you a story. Your therapeutic peer mentor is going to tell you a story. It's going to be jarring. I'm not talking about vicarious trauma during this talk, but you're going to have those times. And it's okay to recognize, okay, wow, that really bothered me. Wow, I need to go do something to like really you know, take care of myself right now. You also, and this is emphasizing mutuality, you as the supervisor, please stress your stories of resiliency. Share them. Share your self-care plan, share how you're doing, be mutually present in those discussions about self-care with your uh, young adult therapeutic care mentors. Also, this will come up naturally in supervision is venting processes. Um, I know many social workers such as myself who would end up drinking cheap beer at a bar after work and processing trauma experiences um, in child welfare. And that was healthy because I was around some peers, but pretty unhealthy in that I didn't feel so great the next day and it probably impacted my work. And so just really recognizing and helping young adult therapeutic mentors to recognize like venting opportunities and how, you know, supervision can be helpful 
therapy can really be helpful too. And so I want to just put a plug in for therapy for supervisors as well, that this, that doing therapy for yourself is a really nice thing. It's really reflective. You get to examine how you are doing. We ask our clients to examine themselves all the time for you being in a parallel process. It's also part of self-care. It could be part of your self-care plan if you wanted. Um, here is a list, and I have these also at the end of the webinar, of some really helpful supervision resources that are designed. Um, some are designed specifically for peer support. Others, I just feel like, are really, really helpful with thinking about peer support, especially this reflective practice guide. Um, these are things that you can reference later on that I think would be super helpful. They're things I drew upon in putting this together. Also, just quickly, we have to recognize that young adults are not going to be young adults forever, and we need to be thinking about career development. This needs to be part of supervision. What do young people see themselves doing next year, five years, 10 years down the line? And really having that be valuable because we want your therapeutic peer mentors to be having those types of career aspiration uh, conversations with young adult clients. And so it's a nice parallel process. Quickly, I want to talk about empathy. Empathy is really, really important. Um, and it's, it's, it's key for the relationship between young adult therapeutic peer mentors and their clients that, and this is a quote from one of our studies from a client talking about how she really, really enjoyed her peer mentor because she understands where I'm coming from and I understand where she is coming from. And this is very, very powerful. But that being said, that we have this very tall, as I mentioned earlier, that the expectations of therapeutic peer mentors is, is a lot. They're not only sharing their struggles, they're displaying genuine understanding, they're building relationships, they're role modeling, and there's, there's less separation between private and public, and there's really this need to reflect on biases, assumptions, what does it mean to be truly empathetic in the relationship, and these are the types of discussions you have in supervision biases and assumptions are going to come up, okay? But in order for a young adult therapeutic peer mentor to be successful, they need to be able to effectively shift the focus from themselves as the client to focusing on the young adult client and their needs and their processes while also balancing active listening, emotional expression, and directives. I was very afraid of advice giving when some of the peer mentors I worked with would just say to a young person, you can't do that or do that. Or I was like, you can't, you can't just tell young people what to do. Why are they listening to you? They don't listen to the adult staff, but it sometimes works better with young adults. And so being open as a supervisor to different approaches and different ways of doing things, so important. But this balance is really challenging to achieve. And it's what you have to be thinking through when your um, adult therapeutic peer mentors are in supervision with you is, how are they balancing all of these things with their clients when they're meeting with them? Also, part of your role as a supervisor is to help your therapeutic peer mentors find their voice and identity. And this is always evolving. It's a process. Um, you also have to really rely heavily on your training. You spent time in getting whatever credentialing you got self-examining and figuring out your assumptions and biases and what your triggers were. Don't expect your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to have gone through that rigorous kind of training, but draw from your own training to think through, how could I develop exercises or how could I bring up things that could help young adult therapeutic peer mentors to think through how they think about things, what their beliefs are. And especially, I'm gonna talk about biases a little bit and assumptions. So many of us all the time have, we all have biases, we all do, and we all make assumptions all the time. And one exercise that I've done that I find was really helpful and was really funny and was great bonding actually early on between um, the peer mentors was we went to a coffee shop and we sat and we watched folks walk down the street and we just said, you know, we made assumptions. We talked about who they were and what they did and what they liked and disliked. And we, had, of course, what the, the goal of the exercise is, is that everyone had a different assumption about the folks walking down the street. Some of us agreed on some assumptions and some of us didn't. And that was the, the point of that. But just to really get at is that, you know, it's not just your lived experience isn't the only lived experience that all the young people you're going to work with are going to have. And if you have too much over-identification with a client's experience, it could potentially hurt the relationship. What ends up happening is that you might end up as a therapeutic peer mentor or as a supervisor just dismissing someone's experience because you think that, oh, well, I know what they went through. I went through it. Instead of exploring it with them, learning about it and understanding it. And so 
that can be challenging if you're just making assumptions that you've been through the same thing, given your peer status. One issue we had is around medications and beliefs around medications. I had one peer mentor who was very, very dead set on everyone, that medications are a bad thing and that they do bad things to people's minds and bodies. And that belief was so strong and the assumption was made across all of his clients where it became really struggling, it became challenging because his clients weren't able to voice, hey, I have a different experience with medication, or I agree with you, it's really tough, but it was, it was challenging to really help him to understand that he had a really strong bias and that his experience wasn't necessarily everyone's experience. Also, I know we really emphasize the peer piece and that it's really important, but sometimes folks who have different experiences are really, really helpful with working with young adults because young adults really value when someone is genuinely interested in really exploring who they are. Um, and, and if you're different and you genuinely are just like an anthropologist going into a foreign land where folks are doing things differently and acting differently and you genuinely are asking questions about that and exploring and understanding, seeking to understand, that that can be really beneficial. So sometimes when you're maybe matching up um, your support workers or your peer support workers with your clients, you might think like, oh, they might be really different, but that might be a good thing. Don't always think that they have to have had the same lived experience. Also, my experience in being a supervisor, young adult peer support workers really, really need to feel that they're making a difference. And one way to do that is to really clarify the outcomes and making sure the outcomes that we're expecting of our young adult clients are achievable and feasible and can be short-term goals that can be achieved. Um, and, and what's really interesting is it can be so powerful for young adult therapeutic peer mentors to partner with their clients on goal formation. It's one of the things that I think is so, so important. I know we say so many of our transition age youth mental health models like that we partner, we empower young people to advocate for themselves um, in their team planning meetings. And I just don't think we always are able to effectively do that. But one way that we really can help to make sure the young adult clients really are partnering is with therapeutic peer mentors in, in developing goals. And I just wanted to suggest, this is from the Plan Do Study Act, this is a Harvard um, uh, evaluation, actually program evaluation approach, but it, it, it lends itself very, very well to practice. And I wanted to, to show you. Um, and so this is something you can do with your young adult therape therapeutic peer mentors in coaching them around, hey, you can sit down with your client and think through, all right, what's the activity that we're gonna do to really achieve a goal? What what is it? Sorry, what is the goal that we're really that we want to do? Like, what is it that it's really going to be individualized for you? What's the description of the of the activity? Where is it going to take place? What's it going to be like? Um, and then, what are our uh, indicators of the goal being achieved? This is a little program evaluate evaluation language, but I think it's important to think through how will your therapeutic peer mentor know they're successful with their client? How will their client know that they were successful with that activity? And of course, SMART goals, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir about things being really specific and measurable and that they be timely, really, really, really important. But then you do a follow-up. So this is something you can do in supervision where you sit down with your you know, therapeutic peer mentor, they plan out their activity they're gonna try. And then the following week, they do a reality check and they're like, okay, what happened with that activity? Did it really go as planned? right? Were the goals achieved? And then the most creative and most exciting part is what's next, right? What is the next thing that we're going to do together? By doing this process regularly, this is also a way to capture evaluation outcomes. Um, it's also a way to make the process very concrete of how activities are planned and what you hope to get out of them um, could be very, very helpful. Um, in looking at the time, I want to make sure I get to some of my key points in the next section. Um, but really, really key in this, I think and I'm gonna emphasize the second point is that your young adult therapeutic peer mentors are gonna be most likely participating in treatment teams, they're gonna be part of a group of people working together and that you are going to really have to advocate on, on behalf of them, that staff take the time to understand where a therapeutic peer mentor is coming from and you're also going to have to help that young adult therapeutic peer mentor to take a step back and to take the time to understand where therapists are coming from, where case managers are coming from, where the young adults are coming from, right? Really thinking through, okay, why do some people have beliefs that are different than mine? How are they different? How can we share some common ground? So quickly, I think being very, very, um, accommodations are really important. 
with um, young adult peer support workers, they can be very informal, but I would say write them down. Any, any accommodations that you write, that's my one advice, is you want to document them and you want to follow up about them. So my one take home that I'd like you to leave with, um, one way to make sure that accommodations happen and that there's no shaming around asking for accommodation or needing an accommodation is knowing that the American Disabilities Act exists and that you need to know how to request accommodations and also respond to a request. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, some folks just stop showing up. And even though they might know about accommodations, they might not be willing to say, I need something different. Like, this isn't working out. This is too stressful or this is too much for me. And so you have to have that strong working alliance with your therapeutic preventers to have these conversations. Also, um, this is a process, right? That is a really important one. You want your young adult therapeutic peer mentors to have gone through the process of asking for an accommodation. And why is that? Because you want them to share that story and that experience with their clients, okay? So when we think about accommodations, they have to be reasonable. And the key things are, when we think reasonable, we have to think, okay, is this something that the, the client, or sorry, the uh, young adult therapeutic peer mentor can perform essential job functions um, productively and efficiently? How long is this going to last for? And what is the undue hardship? Is there going to be any undue hardship on the agency, on the team, on the supervisor because of this? You need to think of those things. Um, and it has to be an interactive dialogue. Again, using that word dialogue, that you bring up accommodations with your young adult therapeutic peer mentor, or they bring it up with you, and that you want to make sure you have that conversation with a third party, your supervisor, maybe an HR person, someone else who can really be part of the brainstorming process. Recognize that accommodations, one size does not fit all, and there are multiple solutions. There are, the types of accommodations can be very, very creative as long as it really helps the person to be successful, but you want to agree upon an accommodation and you want to write it down. And here's a list of questions that are helpful. To, uh, to have when you're having this conversation, right? You really want to examine and explore which accommodations seem to be helpful and what's that undue hardship going to be? Is it going to impact the agency? How long would it impact the agency for? And is that undue hardship or is that just, you know, you need to do this so this young person can be successful? You don't want to lose excellent young adult therapeutic peer mentors because accommodations were not talked about. Some of the accommodations that we use most of the time were around flexibility with hours, shifting hours. Um, our peer mentors worked part time. And so just really shifting the hours to work for their schedule. Many of our young adults uh, were also in school, had part time jobs, were caregivers, had other responsibilities. And so we wanted those other responsibilities to exist so that they did share those stories with their young adult clients, but also just recognizing that um, being flexible as those, you know, college schedules change or maybe when an appointment with a psychiatrist change, changes and making sure you make an accommodation so that your therapeutic preventer can get their treatment. Um, also, you might want to, you might also, oops, something's going on with the thing. Oh, it's back. Okay. Um, also thinking through paperwork requirements. I know this is something that has been talked about repeatedly. It's talked about with the peer support workers at Thresholds figuring out how you can alter the uh, paperwork requirements and perhaps the caseload size, just being really realistic um, about, you know, you want your young people to be successful, partner with young people, write down what accommodations you choose. Um, and also it doesn't have to be a big thing with HR unless your agency decides that that's the process, right? And so depending on how, and this is where you talk to your supervisor, hey, you know, so-and-so would like an accommodation and thinking this, should we go to HR or not? And you just have a conversation. You need to have an open dialogue and be very transparent about this. Okay, so we're at the one hour mark and I do just want to talk through, and I have a lot of examples for, just for strategic storytelling. I just want to highlight some of the examples of um, strategic sharing and um, how you can support your young adult therapeutic peer mentors in being successful in sharing their stories and staying safe in their sharing of stories. Um, it does come with risks and my principles as a supervisor are recognizing stories change all of the time and that stories are ever evolving and what's triggering today when you tell your story might not be triggering tomorrow and you need to be okay with that, right? Um, also, 
Don't be afraid of the storytelling being personal. That's the whole point. So as a supervisor, you're hearing these stories, you're gonna help your therapeutic mentor to shape the story in order for them to share it with their clients, right? And so yes, it looks like narrative therapy and you can go to the narrative therapy practice and literature and really draw from that. I think that's actually really helpful. There are unintended consequences for sharing stories. There, there always will be, and that's why you're there, is to help your young adult therapeutic peer mentors process those. When they have that emotional reaction, when they hear a story or share a story, that's what you're there, to make sense of those. And reflection on these is necessary, right? This idea of not only you're reflecting on relationships, you're reflecting in supervision on, when you shared your stuff with your client, what happened? How did the client respond? How did you hope for them to respond? How did you feel, et cetera? Here's some resources for strategic sharing. Strategic sharing actually is developed primarily out of the child welfare field. And what it's doing is it's really looking at, you know, telling your story in order to um, get change happening on a, on a higher level, on a more macro level. And so when you get folks in front of legislators, you get folks in front of panels at some conference sharing their lived experience story that's really trying to change people's understanding of an experience. Those can be really helpful. And so a lot of these materials are aimed at that, but I think they transfer really, really nicely. And they're things I drew from when I was um, a supervisor. So first, what you want to do with your therapeutic mentors is walk them through why they're sharing their stories, what are they hoping to achieve? What's the content? And this becomes a lot of fun when you get to actually, and I, I do suggest in your supervision, having story writing and storytelling opportunities where you practice telling your story. And you have others, if this is why group supervision works so well for this, actually be like, oh, I don't get that. You're missing a key element to your story, right? Because sometimes like, you know, storytelling, some of us are good at it, some of us aren't so great at it. And so you might have to help your young adult therapeutic peer mentors develop their storytelling skills. And what are the key like elements that need to be there to get your message across, right? Then you really have to think about who your audience is and you know, different, think about the different clients that you're working with and how they might respond differently to a certain story. And there's, as you think through this, there are stories that we tell over and over and over in our lives, right? And like thinking through how those stories have changed over time and how you change that story for a different audience, like draw from your own experience of that. I um, mean, don't be afraid as the supervisor to practice this with your clients. If you want to really, or not, sorry, practice this not with your clients, with your young adult ther therapeutic peer mentors, you want to be practicing this, right? Storytelling is an art. And so you want to be vulnerable and experience that mutuality of storytelling, right? Also, really, really, really important is the storyteller claims the meaning and the significance of the story. You don't let that young adult client say, well, that's a stupid story. Why'd you do that? Blah, blah, blah. And then you leave as a therapeutic peer mentor feeling like crap, right? That your story didn't go over as intended. This happens all the time um, in society where we're sharing stories and we don't get the intended thing. But what we really want to do is empower that therapeutic peer mentor to claim their story and say, well, this was my intention. This is how it makes me feel. I was hoping to achieve that and walk away feeling empowered and able to share that story to another client and not think it's a bad story or a story that doesn't make sense. Um, you really have to embrace those emotions when you tell a story and you tear up right in the moment. You should really coach your therapeutic peer mentors to identify that emotion and say, wow, as I'm starting to tear up, as I'm starting to get irritated when I tell this story, it's because this really triggers me. This really sets me off. This really upsets me. It still really gets me. Naming that emotion and not letting the young adult client name it for the peer mentor, very, very important. You really want to help the young adult therapeutic peer mentor to own their story, own the emotion that they have while they're sharing it. And finally, here's some example, or some suggestions um, of how to practice, how to really, really, really do good strategic storytelling. Um, here are some examples of prompts that you might use in your supervision to get your young adult ther therapeutic mentors thinking about storytelling and telling and sharing stories. Um, really use group supervision if you have the opportunity to do it. Really, really fantastic. Um, also, and I just wanted to mention this, is that I cannot 
overemphasize the importance of sharing a story and, and displaying empathy are, are key, but you also need to be able to facilitate a conversation with your clients. And so using active listening and motivational interviewing, super, super important. Body language plays a role. Use your clinical judgment and your best practice skills to coach your therapeutic peer mentors in how to demonstrate they're interested in their client stories. Here's just some examples of motivational interviewing. Um, there's so much out there motivational interviewing. I have a, a resource at the bottom of the page. It just is like a five page snapshot of it. But the, recognize that having open ended questions and questions that are structured the way that you see on this slide really, really add to a therapeutic peer mentor's ability to, to engage that young adult client and to keep the storytelling going back and forth. And finally, I think it's really, really important to think about disclosure policies. Um, when young people share their story and it's used on our agency websites, we go to a conference, we need to really be thinking about the risks of, of storytelling and how long those types of items are online and accessible online. Um, this is beyond just an initial consent form. I think it should be something that's revisited at least every six months. Um, and making sure that young adults who are your therapeutic mentors who might be featured on your website understand um, that their stuff's out there and are okay with that. And, and know that young people might change their mind on that as well. Um, best practices out there are to limit the amount of time that information is available on the internet. Okay. My last couple of slides, this is just a shout out to the people who are like, hmm, I'm really going to have to figure out how to explain that therapeutic peer mentoring matters to my agency, to my community mental health system, to my colleagues, what's the impact. So one thing I would suggest is figuring out very, very simple ways to measure. One way as a supervisor, you can do check-ins with your therapeutic peer mentors and just keep a log of the types of things that they're talking about, the types of struggles they're having, the types of successes they're reporting with their clients in order for you to later draw on those and like, look, you know, over six months, I had all my, ther or all my therapeutic uh, peer mentors described these types of, you know, successes that they had with their clients. It's a really nice way to capture, um, it's not the most rigorous research uh, design, but it's a way that you could capture some things. Also, the um, goal progress tracking sheet that I described earlier, um, where the young people are really partnering on developing goals and, and, and looking at where these goals achieved, you could look at those every quarter, every six months, and summarize them as a way to capture things. It's more of a very qualitative approach to evaluation, but I really think it's important that we document this and have discussions about how we're doing therapeutic peer mentoring, what's working, what's not, what are some of the outcomes we're tracking, because that's the only way we're going to, as a field, move this forward as something that would be evidence-based in the future. And finally, as my, my very important slide, the benefits to being a clinical supervisor. These young people are going to inspire you like nobody's business. There is nothing like the opportunity to be a mentor to a young person who's developing, they're, they're, they're in their recovery process, they're figuring out what they want to be, and you get to be part of that. And you also get to be part of their process of learning how to be a, a peer support. I think it's a really, really nice piece. Also, just seeing, this is one thing I've heard from so many, I've talked to a lot of supervisors of peer support workers across the country, and what I consistently hear, it's so cool to see young people in their recovery process, like further along. And often we see clients that are struggling all the time. And so it's so nice to see young people that are successful and to support their success. Um, it's a very empowering thing uh, as a practitioner. Also, this is a real opportunity for you to be a change agent at your agency and to really introduce these radical ideas of emotions are good during sessions, you know, for both the um, provider of the service and the client to experience. Like these are radical and it's exciting. Um, also that it's a real opportunity. We are not good at engaging transition age youth 
in mental health services, no one's good at it. We're figuring it out. And so this is one tool amongst the many tools that your agency would have. And just know that you're part of it. And so definitely the benefits, I would say, outweigh the challenges. Again, I don't have systematic research stating that, but I can tell from my anecdotal conversations with clinical supervisors of peer mentors for young adults, it's a very, very rewarding process. Um, I want to open this up for questions now, and I apologize for going over a little bit. Um, I tried to keep my examples of stories kind of short, but I'm wondering if there is any questions. And later in these slides, I have some references and resources, but let me come back to this slide. Hi, Dr. Klodnik. Uh, thank you so much for your, your great presentation. Uh, we do have one question that at Hawking, and if any more come in, I'll, I'll read them as they come in. Uh, the first one is, do you know of a curriculum or PM group supervision or specific activities that are utilized in um, that setting? Great question. So, no. What I'm hoping to give you are a lot of tools that you can integrate into your own we uh, at Thresholds and in partnership with the Transitions RTC at UMass, uh, we're in the process of developing a manual that we do hope to flesh out in the future, but that would be a few years from now. Um, the idea of a curriculum you could draw from um, the Wellness Recovery Action Plan work of Mary Ellen Copeland would be something. Again, I know that sounds like a clinical practice, but it's taking some of those elements of those you know, self-care planning practices and bringing them into your supervision. Around the coaching and development, um, I was taking rigorous notes every, at, the, at the end of every supervision I did in order to understand what were some of the issues that were coming up and then to build in training sessions, like mini training sessions into supervision around those things. Like that empathy piece and that bias and assumption piece, that all comes from my own practice experience of that being a big thing that was consistently an issue um, with young people for whatever reason, in their development, um, in their relational experiences, having some struggles on stepping out, like being able to be empathetic and say, ah, I get you, but then it, beyond that was sometimes a struggle and really helping young people to see that their belief and holding that belief real tight wasn't always helpful to their clients, right? That they needed to be open to clients' beliefs and clients' understandings of things. And so unfortunately, I know I'm not really answering your question, there aren't, to my knowledge, any specific curriculums from peer support for peer support. That being said, Kansas, well, there's some, there are a few peer support. Um, University of Kansas has um, peer support stuff, but it's not necessarily um, a curriculum for the support of peer support, if that makes any sense. Um, so not that I know of. Really, it's going to be up to you, and this is what I would suggest if you guys, if the supervisors on this webinar, have the opportunity to get together regularly and share what you are doing and build a toolkit, if you will, a best practice, as you will, if you will. Like That's the kind of things that we need to develop specifically around young adults, because I think young adults are facing different stuff than maybe some of the adult peer support literature is going, it's, it's not necessarily going to be as helpful. So no, I'm sorry that I don't know of that. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, how do you balance accommodations with professional expectations in the workplace from peer mentors? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It depends on what kind of professionalism that you're, you're specifically thinking about. Um, sometimes you're going to have young people who come into this role um, who need some development um, around their own professionalism in the workplace. And so I like to talk about that as um, cultural capital. And you have to help young people develop their workplace cultural capital and understand how to talk, how to behave how to react, how to act in meetings, how to act with clients. Like You may end up doing a lot of coaching with that. And that can be, if you're doing group supervision, really helpful to give examples um, and have role plays, right? Um, but specifically with accommodations in that respect, um, it's interesting. Because we had part-time peer mentors and I did, we every morning I would do um, like a 10 minute check-in or 15 minute check-in. Wasn't supervision necessarily, but it was just helping um, the young adult peer mentors like 
kind of structure their day and, and what clients they were going to meet with and what activities they were planning on doing. Um, at first, it was also kind of a control thing for me <laughs> to know what was happening. Like, I felt like I needed to know that I, I wasn't as trusting of this process. Um, but with the, specifically, let me get away from that, my tangent, but thinking through accommodations, um, you know, I think if they're timely, so again, it's thinking about the time and being realistic. So, okay, let me give, um, here's an example. Um, a young woman was so motivated. She was almost done with um, a GED program and we hired her even though she hadn't finished high school. And one of our minimum requirements was that she, that our, our uh, peer support workers had to have a high school diploma, but she was on her way. She had a lot of rich experiences of struggling with mental health symptoms and not doing well in school. And we really thought that that could be really beneficial. So we gave her a time period where we said, you've got six months to finish your GED and pass the exam. And when she didn't, this is the reality of this, um, when she ended up not passing the exam, we actually did have to let her go. So our accommodation was we were, we were willing to hire her if she kept working on this, but she had to have it done. And then when she didn't, we had to let her go. Um, but that's being, again, written down. I cannot emphasize that enough, um, is writing down the accommodations and, and checking back in with them. Don't just think that the, the accommodation doesn't have to last forever. Um, but we really wanted, our goal was to have our uh, therapeutic peer mentors engaging in post-secondary ed. That was something that we really was valuable. And that may be in your context that you want your clients to be doing more post-secondary ed. You want your, therefore, your therapeutic peer mentors engaging in that process to share those struggles and share those experiences. And so we really, we, it took us a while to realize what were the key characteristics that we wanted in our peers. And so, you know, with that accommodation, that didn't work out, but we had other accommodations on like thinking about different things um, that did work out um, around really mental health symptoms. And so when a young person um, experienced a hospitalization, do I mean really had to leave work, really feeling not okay and went to the hospital and was there for a couple of days. And then we checked in, you know, doing that outreach, do not underestimate how important that outreach is for your therapeutic peer mentors to think they still have their job. And then intervening and talking through, okay, so what is feasible getting back? Like what was stressful and really examining the context, like less about what is it about this peer mentor that made them, and I don't want to use this word, but I'm going to this, fail. Why did this experience fail for them? Rather think about, okay, what was going on with the conditions that produced this? What can we do to change this up to have this person be successful? And so for that person, we actually had, we, the accommodation was, is that she met with clients in the community. And this was actually an accommodation we met, we did for a few different peer mentors who struggled with being at the agency, but that for them, especially the ones who were graduates, was just so challenging for so many reasons that it was, okay, well, then you're going to have meetings uh, in the community. And then the hardship on my part was I then would meet with the young person at the Starbucks down the street, right? So like then I just had to shift my day a little bit, um, which wasn't a big deal. And so I think through, it's thinking through what really makes sense. And then also thinking about how your other peer mentors are going to see that. And is it going to be, are they going to see it as fair or not? And so you have to always keep in mind that there's, these are young people. They talk, they feel things in relation to fairness and what their colleagues are experiencing. I think that really being clear, writing things down, making sure the accommodation um, is a dialogue that it's followed up on is just really key. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Klodnick. Um, at this time, uh, no new questions have popped in yet, but um, I just wanted to take this second to remind everyone that the webinar is being recorded and uh, the webinar and the slides will be made available on the Transitions RTC's website, as well as the um, link to the resources that Dr. Klodnick mentioned. And um, part one is already posted on the RTC's website, so if you need to refer back to that now, it's available. Um, I'd look, check end of next week, perhaps, for part two. Uh, Dr. Klodnick, did you have any closing remarks you'd like to make in the last couple of minutes? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that this, and again, I know I ended my last slide on this, but just what a really empowering experience this is, and that as a supervisor, you're going to have to be a little vulnerable, and you're going to have to examine yourself and examine your self-care practices, 
and really think through how you can be a role model and how you can really effectively collaborate and partner with therapeutic with your young adult therapeutic peer mentors and it can be a lot of fun right but that and then that's the thing is that these young people are so hopeful oftentimes most of the time and that they're going to make you think about things in a way that you are like oh and it, it sort of reminds me of working with students who come in and who see the, the your agency in a new way and they alert you to all the system issues and and they're very critical and you're like oh yeah that's how it is but it doesn't have to be that way and so working with young adult therapeutic peer mentors are going to uncover some systems and some practices and policies at your agency that you're going to be like whoa you're right that shouldn't be that way and you have a real chance to change things for the better for your agency and in doing so so you really, really, really are going to increase young adult client engagement and services. Um, one last thought too, and I, I should have mentioned this, I'm sorry, I skipped over this in one of my bullet points, was you really want a quorum of young adult therapeutic peer mentors that are participating in committees. So if your agency has a wellness committee or a something like a policy, a best practice committee, you want to make sure that these these this, these folks in these roles have opportunities to be there, and they're not just the only peer mentor there. Make sure that there's at least two, um, but making sure those opportunities to be part of the agency culture are there. That's the way your agency is going to really integrate um, young adult clients and serve young adult clients better. So those are my final thoughts. Sorry, I, I missed those. Um, but thank you for the good work you do. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to always email me reach out to me. I love, as you can tell, I really enjoy talking about this stuff. It's complex and complicated, but we need to have a dialogue about it. And so please reach out. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and we will talk to you later, I guess. <laughs> Um, thank you, Dr. Klodnik, so much for your time, and uh, thank you for GMH for setting this up. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thanks.